Hey everybody and welcome to another edition of Month in Review. So this is a series where I talk about all the new to me games I played in the month prior, this one being January 2022, and I rank them from my least favourite to my most favourite. Now I think out of all the videos of these I've done, this one might be the most diverse one, diverse one so far, ranging from games that dated as back as early as 1930 to 2021, games that are for kids and pretty heavy involved Euros. Um, but before I get started on the video, I want to give a shout out to the show's sponsor, kienda.co.uk. So if, the, if you live in the UK and you regularly purchase board games, be sure to check out their great website. But let's get started. So first off, at number 20, I have Dragon's Breath. So this is essentially a kid's game where you have these rings that are stacked up upon each uh, one another, and then you've got a bunch of these little plastic gems that go inside, and then you're basically trying to remove these rings to try and make a certain number of your gems fall out and make other people's gems fall out and fall down these holes to be lost forever. That's pretty much the extent of the game. I think this was so bad that it was good, um, you know, for all the wrong reasons. You know, we, we laughed because it was so bad. Of course, this isn't really tailored towards um, adults. We played it just for a bit of fun, um, and, you know, I can't rate it any higher than last place because it was just a terrible game and I couldn't even understand why kids would like it. And funny enough, the person who bought this bought it for their very young daughter and she hated it as well. So there we go. That is Dragon's Breath. That one came out in 2017. Uh, at number 19, I have Monopoly Deal. So yeah, the word Monopoly has appeared on a Chairman of the Board episode. There we go. So uh, this one is basically a set collection version of Monopoly. And a bit of take that as you're drawing cards, you are trying to put out um, properties of certain colours in front of you. And once you get, I think it's two or three sets, then the game uh, ends and you win. And you're basically trying to buy property of other people. You can use these cards as money so that you can pay your fines and things. Um, really basic stuff. Some pretty nasty take that stuff in it, which I don't really tend to enjoy. And um, to be honest, the game was pretty terrible. Um, but I actually heard some good things about this one prior to, um, you know, prior to me playing it. Um, but that one goes back to 2014. And yeah, I would strongly um, recommend you give that one a miss. That is Monopoly Deal. At number 18, I have a brand new game out, 20, 2021 release. Uh, this is Whirling Witchcraft. So I was actually expecting quite a lot from Whirling Witchcraft. So this is a weird game as you are essentially trying to convert cubes into other cubes, almost like this engine building manner, and then you put them into this cauldron, and then this cauldron rotates each round to the person sitting next to you, and they'll take all those cubes into their player board and stack them in rows. And the idea is you're trying to overwhelm your opponents by giving them so many cubes that they can't contain them, and then they overflow their cauldron and essentially lose the game. So you're trying to force your opponents to lose the game in this one, which generally is a is a style of play that I don't like. Uh, I thought this game had some really tacked on mechanisms that just did not need to be there. And I think ultimately the thing I didn't like most about this one was how subject you are to the card draw. So for example, if you are really getting overwhelmed with blue cubes, and then you don't, you don't have any cards to help you get rid of blue cubes, then you're pretty much you're pretty much done for. And that's how this game played out for me. So very abrupt, unsatisfying finishes, um, and I didn't like the game, simple as that. So that is Whirling Witchcraft at number 18. At number 17, I have a game called Oh Hell. Um, this is going back to 1930 and is pretty much a traditional, um, you know, classic trick-taking game. Uh, in this one, you are basically given a hand of cards. Uh, I think it fluctuates as the game goes on. So you start with a big range of cards, going down to just a few. And then you are betting on how many tricks you think you're going to win. And if you get that right, then you are going to get a boost of, of points. Very simple stuff, you know, very, again, a very classic traditional card game. Um, but it works for what it is, you know, still... Trick taking isn't my style really, I'm not a big fan of it, but this one was okay and I'd happily play it again because it's quick, it's simple, and um, you can teach it to anybody really. So that is Oh Hell at number 17. At number 16, I have The Adventures of Robin Hood. So this is a 2021 design. Um, and this one is, to be honest, the only reason this is lower on the list is because this just isn't my style of game. I mean, I generally actually really appreciate what this game achieves. It's very ambitious. As you, as you have this big map, uh, probably, probably the best looking board I've ever seen, to be honest. Absolutely gorgeous Michael Menzel artwork. Yeah, amongst the best board, I think, yeah, probably my top five boards I've ever seen. But this one, you have certain spots on the board where you flip them over, almost like an advent calendar, and they go to the other side. You're going through the story as, you know, Robin Hood and his merry men. 
um, you know, visiting different people, talking to them, filling objectives. Um, I had quite a cool initiative system as you were drawing things out of the bag. Um, you're constantly referring to this book where you're reading through different passages and things to you know develop the story and go on. Uh, it's it's good for what it is. As I said, if you have a family who likes story-driven games, it's not really going to get much better than Robin Hood. But for me personally. It's not going to be a kind of game that I dive into. Nothing that really, you know, captures me too much because I'm, you know, I'm a mechanisms man. This is very much a story and theme game. Um, but again, if you like that style of game, I really recommend giving this one a look because it is, I think it's quite special to be honest, but just not for me. So that is uh, Robin Hood or The Ad Adventures of Robin Hood at number 16. So moving on to number 15, we have a pretty um, a pretty obscure game. This one is Hounded, uh, dating back to 2016. This is a two-player abstract game as one person is a um, basically a hunter and they have a bunch of their, their hounds, their hunting hounds with them, and the other person is a fox. And the idea is that as the fox, you're trying to move around this grid of tiles, trying to find certain ones before the hunter traps you and you can't move anymore. So it's got quite a bleak theme and one that, you know, I thought it was quite interesting that they went for it because, you know, fox hunting is quite taboo, I suppose. But I like, you know, I always like it when people you know, don't care about that kind of thing. Uh, but this one, it, it was a pretty traditional, standard, abstract style game. Um, but it works well. I think it's slightly imbalanced in favour of the fox. I think you're a bit too agile to outmanoeuvre the hunter. Um, but again, I like the theme. I like the um, I like the idea of it. And I would play it again. It's pretty quick. But I think ultimately, when games like this aren't too balanced, and I have a bit of doubt in my mind that you know it's just not fair on one person. Then you know that ton that tends to be a bit of a you know a bit a big negative for me. But uh, you know more plays might might you know, balance that out. So um, we shall see. That is Hounded. At number 14, I have Lost Kingdoms, um, Pangaea in Pieces. This is a another 2021 release. This was, I believe, a backed on Kickstarter. Um, this is an area control style game based on, on dinosaurs. So you are basically, have a bunch of these dinosaurs and you can kind of... Um, you can kind of breed with each other and expand your, you know, your pieces on the board. You can move them around. You have this dynamic board state where you're sliding these tiles from area to area. You're trying to spread yourself as thin as possible, but but control those majorities. Very standard stuff, in my opinion. You know, this has been done a thousand times. Pretty much abstract in this game, but because it's there's nothing really wrong with it. There's just nothing terribly exciting about it, and there's a million better tile placement games out there and better abstract games out there. But this one just didn't really do anything new, which I think is a quite strange for a game like that to come out in 2021, which doesn't really try anything different at all. Um, so nothing wrong with it, but just nothing nothing special about it whatsoever. So that is Lost Kingdoms at number 14. Uh, at number 13. I have four seasons. So this is a small box card game. Um, it's a I pick, or sorry, I split, you choose mechanism, which has been kind of made broader appeal in, in games such as um, Hanna Makoji. This one predates Hanna Makoji by quite a while. And you are essentially given a bunch of these cards that value in ranges. So you've got like a strength one, strength two, and strength three cards. You have, I think it's four different suits each to the, um, to the seasons. And then all you're doing is you're picking two cards from your hand, giving them to your opponent. They'll choose one of them to act as a kind of a bid, and they'll use the other one to act to put in the in the points pool, which you're both fighting for. So it's all about you know how are you going to split those cards so that your opponent doesn't benefit too, too much from them, and the choices aren't so easy for them to stop them running away with, with the points. It works perfectly fine. No issues whatsoever with it, and in fact, it's quite a good game, particularly when it comes to the second half of the game when things really ramp up and you know the kind of things you want to go for. I thought the first half of the game was a bit too much going through the motions, not really having much guidance of what you want to do, but again, the second half of the game really did come alive. Um, but ultimately, the game didn't really hit the higher peaks of this list because a game like Kanemi Koji does everything this game does better than it. So therefore, I can't warrant keeping it. It's too similar, but simply not as good in any way, shape, or form. So a fine game in its own right. You know, if I played this one without knowing about Hanami Koji, this will probably fit higher on the list. But because that game exists, this one has just been just rendered void for me. So that is four seasons at number 13. Uh, at number 12, I have another 2021 design with Watch. So Watch has come out with 
pretty little spotlight on it. So this actually has a really cool theme um, as you are essentially working in this watch factory but secretly you are smuggling out these war munitions, um, but you can be caught by the other players if they go to a certain spot in what's basically a, a rondelle. So you are essentially gaining resources. You can convert these resources into these crates, which will give you more points the earlier you do them. You can convert those crates into better crates. And again, you can go to that spot where you can try to guess where other people are gonna go in future rounds. And if, you, if they go there, then you can actually almost like tax them or blackmail them to pay you money. And you have this kind of development board where you are constantly increasing things. Um, and making yourself better and more efficient. And when you remove these discs from your personal player board, you're putting them on a scoring track, which will give you points in kind of three different strategies to go for. And you know, on the, on the surface level of this game, I thought it was quite clever, um, but in reality, I didn't think it really had any highs. It was pretty standard fare. I didn't find anything tremendously special about it, despite sounding and looking different and being a fresh, you know, a fresh theme. I thought the scoring was okay, um, as again, you would invest in these different strategies. Aren't you? Are you going to go for a money strategy? Are you going to go for a, a gear strategy? Are you going to go for the munition strategy? Um, and you'd invest in these tracks, which I thought was a bit too zero sum. You can clearly see who was going to run, run away with it if it went down that path. And I thought also there was quite a lot of scope for analysis paralysis, because when you'd invest in one of these tracks, you would kind of hinder your ability to score another thing. And it's always, always about kind of min-maxing that and how you're going to benefit the most. So. I wanted to like this one. Unfortunately, it just fell a bit shy and um, just didn't quite, you know, didn't quite hit that or, or scratch that itch that I wanted it to. So yeah, unfortunately, couldn't quite recommend Watch despite its best efforts. Uh, next up at number 11, I have Timeline. So this one goes back to uh, 2011, or I think there's several versions of this. Uh, this version I played in particular was the Historical Events version. This is probably one of the easiest games I've ever played where you are given a bunch of cards with different historical events on them, and you are putting them on the on this queue of cards um, one turn at a time. So you know, you're gonna play a card, then somebody else is gonna play a card, and it's each time you play a card, you have to get that event in chronological order. So you know, you don't wanna play World War I after World War II, for example. But I love this kind of thing. I, I, like, I like history, I like trivia, so, and, because this one is completely accessible by anybody. I mean, you've learned the game just by my explanation there. Um, this one, I think, is a really good fit to play with, again, with anybody. You can play young, you can play old, um, you can learn things as you go throughout this game, so it's educational. And you know, I know, I, I like it. I'd love to try all the different versions and mix them into one big thing. And um, just, yeah, I, I thought it was a great game and I'd happily own this one. So that is, uh, that is Timeline, that's the Historical Events Edition. Uh, at number 10, I have Brian Buru. So this is a 2021 Pierce Sylvester design that is pretty damn unique, to be honest. So this one is a hybrid trick-taking and area majority style game, as you have a bunch of cards which you've drafted, and then you are choosing a location on the board, all of which have are broken into different regions and then further broken into, I suppose, towns or cities with different colors on them. And then you are basically choosing a location and then the person who's chose that location is leading the trick with a card from their hand. Um, and they, all those the cards have numbers on them. They have bonuses on them. If you win the trick, they have bonuses or on them if you lose the trick as well. So you do have to strike this balance of, you know, do I want to win this region to put my control marker down there to score the area majority bonus? Or do I want to lose that trick on purpose to get the really cool benefit from it? And then on top of that, you are climbing tracks to get ongoing benefits. You are, um, you can climb this kind of religion track or put these markers down where it will increase the influence of one of your pre-existing spaces on the board. There was a lot about this game I liked. It played in a very succinct amount of time. Um, I wasn't really expecting to like it and I did enjoy it quite a lot. Um, I thought one of the parts of the game was weaker than the others where you'd have these Viking tokens. And if you had the most Viking tokens, you can essentially render another player's piece obsolete on the board, which I thought was a bit, yeah, it didn't quite hit the spot for me. Um, but the rest of it I enjoyed. I'd play this one again. It only takes about an hour to play for quite a thinky involved game. Again, different. Um, this one really did kind of bring back memories of a game like The King is Dead, where I really appreciate the game design, but would I find myself ever, ever requesting to play the game? Probably not. 
at number nine, I have Welcome To. So this is um, going back to 2018, and it is a roll and write style game as you're building up this neighborhood, I suppose. Um, and I suppose this is regarded as one of the better, one of the more famous roll and write games. Um, and this one certainly lived up to that expectation for me. You know, I, for some reason or another, I hadn't played this one until this month. Um, and I really enjoyed it. So you've got quite a lot to think about in this game as you are trying to build up, again, ascending numbers on these different rows of houses. You can divide these houses up into blocks and then invest in the blocks that you've built. Um, yeah, lots of good stuff going on here. Agonizing decisions, you know, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? And I really enjoyed it. So yeah, just a solid, well-rounded roll and write game and probably a top tier one, um, I would quite confidently say. So yeah, really enjoyed this one. Play it. Happily play this one any time. Nice fast game, but still quite thinky, quite involved, but not too much where it's convoluted. So yeah, hits a really good niche for me and um, just balances things just right for what this game is supposed to do. So yeah, I really enjoyed Welcome To and I think it's a wor very worthy to be in the top 10 of the month. So that is Welcome To. Uh, at number eight, I have another 2021 design. This one is Picture Perfect. So this one, I love the theme of this game as you are essentially getting a, a bunch of people together for a family photo or you know just a group photo. Um, however, all these different people in this shot want different needs. So some might say, you know, I want to stand next to this chap or I don't want to be stood next to the table or I want my face to be hidden. And as the game goes on, you're going to keep learning the information about what the, these people want in order to orientate your different people in different ways to try to get that optimal shot to get the most points possible. Um, surprisingly, I generally don't like games with memory in them, but this game uses the memory aspect very well because you know you need to think, you know, why did I place this guy here? Because you don't get to look at the information you gained earlier. So, you know, you might think, why did I place them there? Was it because they wanted to be stood next to them or or was it not? Should I am I able to move them? Is that gonna hurt me or is it gonna help me? Um, and I, I really enjoyed that. So a very quick, accessible game, but with a really neat theme. Um, you know, you can call it a deduction, I suppose. And again, that memory aspect comes through strongly, and I thought it was a very, very fresh um, and fun game. Um, that This one's got potential to fall into a, a shield of quality, should I play it more, because I've only played this one once so far, but initial impressions are very positive. Again, achieves what it's supposed to do. Very nice, welcoming gateway game. That is, uh, that is picture perfect. Uh, speaking of gateway games, at number seven, I have Fantastic Factories. So this is a family friendly, very accessible engine building style game as you are acquiring cards in this communal draft, putting them, um, well basically putting them in a tableau and then you're rolling dice to either activate these buildings. Um, you can use your own little headquarters where you're gaining more cards and stuff like that, gaining resources and then using resources to get points essentially. Um, that's, that's basically what the game consists of, just trying to be as efficient as you can and mitigate those dice rolls by using different cards you've acquired before. And this one just flows very nicely, again, very low um, barriers to entry, a ton of possibilities, especially when you start introducing the expansion content. Um, I did play this one with, with all the um, expansion content, and I would say, personally from now on, I would always remove the kind of take that style cards where you could kind of steal resources and things and steal cards off each other. That for me didn't quite fit the game and I generally don't like take that mechanisms anyway. But the rest of it I thought was a joy to play. I could only play this one once but would um, would happily um, you know play it, play it several more times because you get quite a rich experience in quite a succinct amount of time um, but still again very easy to dive into. So that is Fantastic Factory. It's a great intro to engine building, to dice mitigation and card drafting. So yeah, like that one at number seven. Uh, at number six, another 2021 design with Tabanusi uh, Builders of Ur. Uh, this one, um, yeah, this one is a strange one to review for me because um, check out my review because I've already should have uploaded that by the time this video comes out. But this one, is the latest game in the Daniel A. Tashini T-Series by Board and Dice, uh, which are amongst my favorite games of all time. So you've look at my shelf, I've got Tristan Magistus, I've got Zolkin, I've got Teo Teo Wakan, I've got Tekenyu. Uh, I love them all, they're all kind of top 20 games for me. This one just didn't um, just didn't land for me. It was quite fiddly, um, very convoluted, very esoteric and obtuse. Um, don't get me wrong, I did, I did enjoy the game, you know, this is my number six best game of the month. 
But because my expectations were so high for this one, um, I was expecting it to be as good as those other ones and I just don't think it was. I think it might have reached a bit too far in order to inject player interaction into the game as you would kind of put these plans onto the board to get a bonus. But when you put these plans onto the board, you're basically inviting other people to build on your plans to get their own bonus from it. And you can climb tracks and things, you're multiplying your buildings by your tracks, all that Euro stuff, um, getting points galore in different ways. But I think the game is so, um, you know, so unintuitive that it's gonna be a bit of a bugbear to teach anybody new to the game. So I think if you have the right group who are really invested in the game and want to play it again and again, then this might be a good fit. But if you wanna keep teaching this to new people, then it's gonna be a bit of a grinding, um, you know, a bit of a grinding process. And to be honest, as time's developing and as I'm getting more and more experience with board games, these kind of um, you know, more fiddly and convoluted games are kind of becoming a bit more, um, or I'm starting to stand off a bit more from them. And I really do appreciate simplicity and elegance more and more. And I think maybe a game like Tabernusi is the polar opposite of that. You know, despite me, again, I don't want this to sound overly negative. It's a good game. You know, this is a this is a very solid game. But is it going to be one that I'm going to request and pull off amongst all these others? Absolutely not. So therefore, um, it just missed out on getting a recommendation. So that is Tabernusi um, Builders of All. A very, uh, very sad um, disappointment for me, but despite being good. So uh, let's get into the top five then. And this is where my recommendations begin. So this game, so the games from here have a commendation. Be starting with a shield of quality. So the first game with a shield of quality, believe it or not, at number five is Nova Luna. So Ashley and Uwe Rosenberg, I enjoy. And this one is a pretty accessible one going back to 2019. As you are going around this rondelle collecting tiles in a very patchwork style fashion, um, you know, going one, one to three spaces around the rondelle, these tiles are going to have different criteria on them. So they might say, you know, this tile wants to go next to two blues tiles um, and a yellow tile. And you're basically building up this little tableau in front of you, trying to trigger all these objectives as quick as you can, because you're gonna put these little discs on them to say that that objective is complete. And once you've got all your discs complete, then you're gonna win the game. So it's a racing style game, but I love the fact that it introduces that patchwork time track system, where the best tiles cost you more time, where you're gonna to go to the front of this kind of rondelle, and all the other players are gonna keep taking turns until they catch up with you. So you really do need to weigh up, you know, is this good tile worth all that time it's gonna sink, or am I gonna keep acquiring smaller tiles and um, get more mileage out of my turn, and basically take more turns than my opponent. So yeah, a very well streamlined, smooth game. I love the puzzle of this one as you're mapping things out, trying to trace routes for other things, trying to trigger as many things as you can with a single placement. Very satisfying. Only takes 30 minutes to play. And um, yeah, this one's gone straight in my t into my collection. And um, I'm gonna get quite a few more plays out of this one. So yeah, not normally the biggest Uwe fan, but his lighter games seem to hit that spot for me a lot better than his more involved ones. And that is why, um, or oh, sorry, Nova Luna is another example of that. Uh, at number four, I have Corrosion. So Corrosion, a more involved Euro style game, another one from 2021. And uh, this is basically, engine building the board game. But this game has a slight twist in it where none of your engines are permanent. So um, you're constantly trying to um, basically acquire these or play, you're playing cards, playing cards to acquire the little machines you're putting on your personal player board, which are gonna trigger when either you rotate your engine or when you hit certain spots. You can get these uh, chrome, chrome machines as well, which give you really powerful benefits. I mean, you can use them and exploit them as much as you can. Some machines are gonna completely corrode and just basically depreciate as the game goes on and you're gonna discard them when they hit certain spots. So it's all about trying to extract as much out as you can out of these machines before they go away. And um, I like that efficiency puzzle. Um, I think I, this game actually works really well. It did have a few problems with it, which could quite easily be fixed, which I think the designer is addressing. At uh, number one, the game is too long. Um, it went on about 25% too long and the end of the game, you feel like you're just wanting to hurry the game to finish because it just, it just outstays its welcome that little bit. Um, and number two, I suppose the game arc isn't quite as satisfying as a lot of the other engine builders. So, you know, you're pretty much doing the same thing from start to finish in this game. You know, you're never really building up that huge engine to a big crescendo where at the end of the game, your machine is much different than the one at the beginning, but it's always kind of spinning those plates, keeping the game, keeping the machine in your engine ticking along rather than amplifying it, which I think maybe slightly worked against the game. But other than that, 
I thought it was a really good first design by um, this designer, um, Stefan Bauer, I think he's called. Um, yeah, very, very impressive for a first design. I enjoyed it quite a lot. Definitely got more play, plays in it for me. And I um, happily recommend this one because if you like engine building, I really suggest you give this one a play. So that is Corrosion at number four. Uh, top three now. So at number three, I have a small box card game going back to 2020 with Stella. So Stella, only two players. This one, you are going to basically build up a tableau of cards, or basically two tableaus of cards, which work hand in hand with each other. You're gonna be building one in this telescope, which is basically this puzzly style thing as you're trying to put cards in the, the same types, gonna be in touch with each other. You're trying to control majorities because this telescope is basically divided into three parts. Um, and if you get the highest numbers in them, other, well, more than your opponent, you, you're going to get a big injection of points. Um, but you're also trying to get stars in that telescope because the other tableau, you're going to be trying to build runs of cards. So, you know, your ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, or, you know, three, four, five. And your biggest run of cards in each suit is going to multiply by the same suit stars in your telescope. And that's basically how the game works. But the thing this game does differently than anything else is how you draft the cards in the first place. So essentially, your the first draft is very easy. You're going to pick a card from the row, put it in your hand of three cards, and then play one of them in your telescope or your or your um, notebook, which is your other tableau. But the second draft is really interesting because the card that you played first, you have to take the remaining card from the from the um, from the pool of cards with the same number as the one you've just played because every single card in that row has a number assigned to it. So it does kind of ramp up that complexity, but it really does work well for the game. It makes it feel different. So I love clever little card games. And this one is very clever, very succinct, very restrictive, um, but in a very good way. So I think this game is fantastic and um, definitely um, cemented itself in my you know small card game collection. Love games like this, and this one is a really good example of those clever, thinky card games that um, are going to really stand the test of time. So that is Stella, a uh, really big, pleasant surprise for me. That is uh, number three. At number two, I'm going all the way back to 1998 with El Caballero. So this is by Wolfgang Kramer, um, and basically is a sister game to El Grande, which is my favorite game of all time, but to be honest, the only shared mechanism this game has with El Grande is this card initiative system. As you are playing a card to basically draft a tile first, um, and also the higher numbers give you um, give you smaller amount of caballeros, which are basically your, your influence to be put onto the board. So you know, are you gonna go last but take a big intake of these caballeros to increase your influence, or are you gonna do the vice versa? And timing that is very, very important. And all you're trying to do is build up these regions. You're putting these markers down, which are essentially your investment tokens, which have different numbers on them um, on each end of this edge of this square tile. And you can increase them by rotating this, rotating this tile and um, you know, increase your investment in these different regions to score more points. Um, but I love some of the twists on this game as you can control the, the seas or you can um, place these grande tokens on them, which means that you're um, that your investment token is going to really um, dive into all the different regions rather than just one that it touches. Um, I'll try to get a review out of this one quickly because I think this one has a lot of things to like about it. And when games like this come into you know, come to my attention, you know, we're talking you know twenty four years old now, um, and this game is probably one of the best tile placement games I've played. Um, you know, staying in my collection, I think it's fantastic. Some really cool mechanisms that I've never seen before. And um, I love it when games do that. And you know, Wolfgang Kramer is a master of his field. And um, you know, why this game isn't talked about is baffling to me. It should still be out there. This one should be up there with the Carcassons. It should be up there with the Isle of Skies. But for one reason or not, it isn't. But I think it's that good. So that is El Caballero at number two. And finally, the only game this month to get a, an Elite Shield, so this is my highest commendation, is Goa by Rudiger Dorn. This one goes back to 2004, so another older game. Um, and this one was a real classic Euro style game as you're auctioning for these tiles, but the way you auction for these tiles is very different to anything else, as you have this big grid of, a grid of tiles, and each time you're starting with this first player token on either the edge or the parameter of the board, or on an empty space. And then from then on, each player in a round robin fashion are gonna point or put one of their tokens on a on an adjacent tile, which shows that they are kind of in the 
position of power when that particular tile comes up for auction in the next phase because they get to acquire that for one cheaper than the highest bid amongst the other players. Um, and that's really cool. So all you're trying to do on top of that is you're trying to gain these ships, you're trying to gain resources to upgrade your personal player board, you're trying to colonize these different um, islands, Resource, you know, resource management, upgrading things to get victory points, becoming more efficient as the game goes on. Um, you know, the, the flow of cash is great in this one because when you are auctioning a tile off or when, you win, you know, when you've got your token on that tile, then if somebody else wins that tile, you're going to get that money. So I love the management of resources in this game. Now, are you going to award people too much money by bidding a tile on them, bidding a tile that you want, which is going to put them in a really strong position for future turns? All that stuff is what I love about board gaming. And Goa is just a great example and a great, just a great piece to showcase how good Euros were back in the day. So yeah, very simple to learn, but a ton of depth here. Really good on one of my favorite designers ever. And Goa, probably, maybe even my favorite game of his I've played yet. So um, yeah, Goa, an absolute triumph for me. A huge grail game that I wanted to play for a long, long time. And this one lived up to that expectation. So that concludes this list of 20 games. Um, I've tried to get through them as quickly as I can. Um, of course, I will get reviews out of all of these if I can over the next, probably the next couple of months. So I'm um, keeping out for those and some of these are already reviewed. But um, I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, please hit like and subscribe to the channel and check out my other content too. Additionally, if you want to go that extra step, I do have a Patreon campa campaign where you can keep the channel going for as little as £2 per month. So I'd really invite you to do that and support me and keep me going. So uh, for everyone else, I'll see you next time on Chairman of the Board.